Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are at. My name is Atarud Aziz Inamini, director of the ABC UTC. Uh, just a very brief uh, um, summary of uh, our 2022 International ABC Conference that was just finished last week. We had a very successful uh, uh, conference, uh, more than 500 uh, attendees. Uh, registered and attended the conference and uh, the conference was uh, very well received uh, just to uh, give you the uh, big picture of what we covered in the conference uh, we had our annual abc utc uh, meeting on monday of the, of the week of the conference and then the workshop started on wednesday we had four uh, workshop was very well attended um, on design of the steel bridge, design of the concrete bridge, uh, design of the FRP bridge, and then a workshop devoted to the UHPC. The morning of the Thursday, when, when the conference started, we had the basically our general session and everybody was in the same room. And then starting the Thursday afternoon, we had the AD, uh, technical presentation each of them half an hour so thursday afternoon friday morning and friday afternoon we had a reception on thursday thursday evening uh included entertainment it was very well received uh we had the more than 42 about 42 companies that exhibited at the conference um uh, and we also had uh, we were delighted to tell you that really we had more than 150 state uh, bridge engineers and the bridge owners basically in the in the conference that really added to the value of this conference and the conference was uh, co-sponsored by 32 state dot and the federal highway administration our next conference december 2024 it's going to be miami florida our next conference is going to be beyond just the abc we are going to be focusing on uh innovation in the bridge engineering uh we don't have all the details but we are going to be sharing uh, more detail um with you but uh, the date is set the exact date is not but the month is going to be december of 2024 in miami florida our presentation today features the use of ultra high performance concrete connections for accelerated restoration of life load continuity on oklahoma's us 183 slash 412 bridge over Wolf Creek in 2019. We're pleased to welcome our presenters, Walt Peters, Assistant Bridge Engineer for Maintenance with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, Royce Floyd, Associate Professor in the School of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science at the University of Oklahoma, and Trevor Looney, formerly PhD student on the project at the University of Oklahoma, and now research civil engineer in the Geotechnical and Structures Laboratory at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. In addition, we'd like to introduce our Q&A session moderators, Paul Lyles, formerly Georgia's State Bridge Engineer, and Jugesh Kapoor with WSP USA and formerly State Bridge Engineer at WashDOT. Paul? Hello, everyone. Um, this is going to be a short presentation about a little repair we did on US 183 412 over Wolf Creek in <clears throat> western Oklahoma. You could see where Oklahoma is there with the star. Oklahoma has about 6,800 on system bridges, about 3,000. 700 are span bridges, and of those, 1,700 are pre-stress or a quarter of our inventory. We typically design our bridges as simple spans, but um, for a little while, from 1978 to 85, we did a continuity on our pre-stress design. Uh, this involved some of our longest spans, and some of our biggest stream crossings. The advantages of live load continuity, longer spans, shallower girders, less pre-stressing, 
reduce the number of deck joints with potential for leakage, which as a maintenance uh, person, bridge preservation, that's something I really strive for. Uh, there is potential for smoother road ride. Our designs were a little bit unique, I think, in that we used blocks between our pre-stress beams on the pier. We called them linkage blocks. Most DOTs, I think, on their continuity use full depth, full width diaphragms. You could see on the top left there that we have the cambered pre-stress beams. When we design these, we design for negative moment, of course, by putting rebar in the top of the deck. Um, and that also includes composite dead loads. But in addition, you have something that uh, involves the positive moment that occurs from time dependent shrinkage and creep, uh, which is not something engineers typically design for, but it's very important with these type of designs. And we typically use pre-stressing strands. You see in the right there, in the middle of the screen, that we have strands that are bent up into these blocks of concrete. And then on the left there, we, we have um, our misfortune. It seems like the best plans, well, I thought we had great plans here, but they ended up cracking. Just a um, very high percentage of them, almost all of them. Um, so that's a problem. Here we, we see one of our pre-stress bridges. We went about rating it, um, and we rated it as a simple span because we got these cracks. Now, when you look at things, we use operating ratings, so we're in good shape as far as the typical astral loads go, but when you start thinking about uh, notional loads or SHV or emergency vehicles, uh, we start losing some of our safety factor. We're still in good shape though, but um, this live load being a moving target sometimes can be a concern. Here we see some of the cracks. We had a massive crack on this Hughes County Bridge. Uh, that was the first one we did. Um, you, you know, I think about pre-stress losses and when your beam starts to shorten from this creep and shrinkage, you're losing pre-stress. Of course, we include that in our designs, but this is, helps us visualize what's actually happening in our beam. On the right, you see one of the cracks that I think is more typical, Oklahoma River, I-35, it was pretty tight crack. So we surveyed all these linkage blocks and we found on the left here some with spalls and then on the right, the Highway 2 bridge had the most, more typical crack uh, that, that we see more often. Here we see the 287 bridge that's um, at way, way out in our panhandle, practically in the state of Colorado. This particular bridge, uh, I think, had a issue with the quality of the concrete and you compound that with our cracks and we had some of our worst linkage blocks and this is the only location that I know of that ever leaked on the linkage blocks that we had. This is um, kind of proud of this bridge, US 69 over the Blue River. Um, it actually had a few linkage blocks that did not crack. One, one thing that uh, you can put a composite high density two inch overlay on your bridge deck, you get a little negative moment which counteracts that positive moment from time dependent streak and creepage, which um, helps uh, make the connection better. Uh, this particular block was made a little wider than the gap between the pre-stressed beams, which is kind of unique. I think it's something the contractor did. Um, but we, we lost a corner there. But for the most part, that is doing pretty good. So we had a discussion when we were practicing that uh, so some of these um, bridges built for continuity tend to maintain their continuity. So I just kind of wanted to go out and do kind of some field survey. And I was thinking that um, if I get on the shoulder of the bridge 
get kind of at the far end of the continuity unit, I can <clears throat> look for uh, movement. If I stand in the middle of the bridge, it's uh, when the truck's two spans away, I'm, it's going to deflect down. It's one span away, it's going to deflect up. And there's going to be some movement, and it's going to be before the truck gets to my span. So I can kind of feel if it's continuous or not. And I, I did this once on this uh, Blue River Bridge, I think over 20 years ago, but it was continuous back then. I expect it to be still continuous, which um, it um, when we got some of these double trailer trucks, I, I noticed some continuity and um, I was pleased. Okay, the Calvin Bridge was our first one, and this is the one that had that giant crack. I said, there's no way that that can be continuous. Uh, but I got out there and did the exact same thing. There was a three-span unit on the north end, um, and it, it uh, had come an uphill grade, and, and actually there wasn't so much traffic. And when the trucks finally came, they came individually, which um, gave us the chance to kind of feel things out a little better. And sure, sure enough, this was feeling continuous. And the southbound traffic, when it went by, it um, even though I was on an exterior girder and you don't distribute load much to the exterior girder, I felt movement e even then. So uh, I thought that was extremely interesting and totally unexpected. Okay, this shows the pre-stress on the Blue River Bridge, it had 50. The Calvin Bridge had 54. Stress relieved uh, strands, half inch. This is the Blue River uh, configuration. Uh, we, we tried putting stirrups in that bridge. Uh, confinement reinforcement might be something we want to consider. Uh, this had number eight bars for the negative moment. Um, general findings, I think when you do any designed for live load continuity, you want to think about when you make the connection on your pre-stress beam uh, from time of fabrication to the time of connection ne needs to wait a little longer because of the time dependent effects grow smaller with time and you get less positive moments. So you need to put a lot of thought into that. My observation over the years, <laughs> I Always when we got, I go by a bridge that has this continuity, I look to see how the blocks are doing. And it's my observation that the outside face of the outside beam tends to crack first and seems to crack wider. Maybe an outer plane bending issue, and maybe it's just me, but that's what I observed. Uh, composite dead loads, such as two inch high density overlays, the parapet walls, uh, they help offset the positive moment from creep and shrinkage that's time dependent. So if you have the opportunity to use like a ultra high performance concrete in um, connection, uh, in combination with, with um, uh, linkage block repair, that's the perfect ABC match. I mean, here we have a bridge that um, this is the poor concrete that we had. It's having deck issues, maybe beyond hope. It's ha having linkage blocks issues. It's having joint issues. It um, it could be, I think, a candidate for an accelerated bridge construction using lots of this UHPC technology. Uh, and it's something I wouldn't mind trying. Um, now we'll, that's your introduction. We'll move on to the actual bridge that, that we repaired. Uh, which I think is kind of exciting. It's uh, Wolf Creek on uh, 183, 412. It's um, Northwest Oklahoma, Northwest Passage in Oklahoma. We had five 85 foot spans, three continuous in the middle, type four Ashtel pre stress beams spaced at nine foot three inches, nine and a quarter inch deck thickness, significant agricultural traffic. Uh, we get the usual permit heavy loads, especially out west. There's a lot of oil field activity and the like. This particular bridge had 46 one half inch strands, stress relieved. That works out uh, to a million three hundred thirty thousand pounds of pre-stressing. 
if you ever wonder why our bridges camber, just think about that million pounds of pre-stressing. Um, after we had the cracking in our continuity, we tend to write them as simple spans. Here we have a panoramic view of our Wolf Creek Bridge. And on the right, we see the linkage block. You can see here that the uh, section cracked, as you might expect. Uh, the crack was unusual in that it was on the left side only. Um, and um, any, anyway, this is kind of our typical service condition that we wanted to repair. And so now it's my pleasure to turn things over to our UHPC expert, Dr. Roy Floyd. Thanks, Walt. And uh, as Walt has mentioned, you know, kind of the introduction to, to this particular project, you know, some of the applications that we were considering, uh, some of the needs for repairs uh, that we've seen in Oklahoma, and he's mentioned UHPC a few times. Uh, and so I'm going to start uh, by talking about, you know, what is ultra high performance concrete and then how do we connect this with the research and this field implementation. Uh, and so ultra high performance concrete can generally be defined as uh, cementitious composite having a compressive strength um, between 18,000 and 30,000 PSI uh, and having a post-cracking tensile strength somewhere of at least 700 to 900 PSI uh, that's provided by steel fibers included uh, in a very dense cementitious matrix. Uh, other organizations will have various definitions of UHPC, uh, but generally it includes having a high flowability, an excellent bond strength with conventional concrete, uh, and reinforcing steel, a very low to negligible permeability, high freestyle resistance, and a resulting high durability. Uh, there are a lot of UHPC products that are available uh, and on the market these days, uh, proprietary mixes from various manufacturers, uh, as well as non-proprietary or open source type mix designs, uh, including one developed uh, in conjunction with the ABC UTC uh, that I provide here as an example, uh, not necessarily used on um, all of this project, but throughout uh, in various places. Uh, we developed a, a mix with the Oklahoma DOT uh, and ABC UTC uh, that's shown here on the right as a weight proportion. So one-to-one uh, -one cement to sand ratio, 60% of the cement was type one, 10% silica fume, 30% slag cement, uh, and a water cement ratio of 0.2. Uh, we've tested this extensively, uh, achieved a compressive strength of about 18,000 KSI consistently, uh, about one KSI post-cracking tensile strength, uh, and a cost of about $800 per cubic yard. Uh, we've seen excellent bond strength, uh, seen that low to negligible permeability and high freestyle resistance. Uh, and in addition to kind of what Walt has mentioned already, uh, there are a number of possible applications for UHPC repairs that we've examined at OU and that have been examined in the literature. Uh, including um, repair of expansion joints uh, in the headers on either side of the expansion joint, replacing steel armoring with ultra high performance concrete to have an impact resistant material that can be ground to the profile of the bridge. Link slabs that can be used to eliminate joints, create a continuous deck, but still allow for simply supported behavior. And then in the literature, you'll find uh, several repair applications such as steel girder end encapsulation to repair corroded girder ends, patch repairs of pre-stress girder ends that were uh, examined at Iowa State University. Uh, and then at OU, uh, we've examined uh, repairs of pre-stress girder ends damaged due to shear or corrosion, uh, as well as encapsulating uh, continuity connections such as the ones we're talking about today. Uh, instead of replacing them, just encapsulating them with UHPC. Uh, and in this research, we were using some of that non-proprietary UHPC. Uh, the one on repair of the continuity connections actually just got accepted for publication, uh, so there'll be a paper coming out on that pretty soon. Uh, but in terms of the, the research specifically related to this bridge replacement and then going to the implementation, uh, we kind of had three objectives that we're looking at here. And the first one is to be able to look at the structural performance of a continuity connection made using ultra high performance concrete, uh, both as a potential retrofit uh, of an existing bridge that was simply supported or new construction, so a newly designed bridge and making connections and new beams. Uh, and then we were able to evaluate the effectiveness of a UHPC continuity connection in the field by replacing an existing continuity connection with UHPC. And finally, our ongoing work has the objective to develop design guidance 
for these UHPC continuity connections that's sponsored by the ABC UTC. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about some of the laboratory work and then Trevor will talk about the field implementation. Uh, but in the lab, uh, we started by looking at um, about half scale joints uh, using a half scale approximately ash toe girder uh, that had two pre-stressing strands uh, in the bottom, uh, number three shear stirrups that extended out of the top of the beam to create a composite section. Uh, and these beams were about 18 feet long. Uh, the beams were constructed in our lab at the University of Oklahoma, including the pre-stressing as well as the concrete casting. And once we cast the beams, we created a composite deck with those beams that was intended to match a half-scale bridge section. So it was a narrower section with a slightly larger thickness to give us the same moment capacity. And we had concrete in the beams of about 8,000 PSI and the decks were about 5,000 PSI. We examined two joint details, as I mentioned, one that was intended to represent new construction that utilized the pre-stressing strands in the beams as our positive moment connection in the bottom, and then had the reinforcement from either side of the deck coming into a splice in the joint. Uh, it was a 10 inch wide joint to match what was done in the field in Oklahoma. Uh, we had an additional portion of the deck replaced with UHPC to ensure we had a proper splice uh, in the deck. And for these connections, initially we started out designing our reinforcement uh, in the positive moment region using conventional concrete properties and the methods of Ashto LRFD 2014. Uh, we let the, the girders cure for 90 days before establishing continuity uh, so that we could use uh, the lower strength requirements uh, in the Ashto LRFD specification. And what we came up with was needing two pre-stressing strands coming out of each beam going into the joint and two number three bars with standard hooks uh, with an extension uh, that was based on the ash to lrfd specifications and conventional concrete for the negative moment reinforcement uh, we use conventional mild steel uh, and moment demands based on failing a two-span girder system uh, in the girder at mid-span so with a point load applied on each span we modeled it as a continuous system uh, came up with our negative moment demand uh, and found the amount of reinforcement that was needed in our joint. Uh, we then designed the splice for that reinforcement using UHPC recommendations uh, for the negative moment. For the retrofit joint, uh, we were looking at, again, beams that would already be in place, simply supported, um, being able to connect the two sets of reinforcement in the deck uh, with a straight lap splice bar in the top having a narrower joint between the beam ends, so it will be based on the existing um, girders, and then using straight bars across the bottom to create a connection for any uh, positive moment that was created by temperature effects. Uh, we again have uh, a narrower joint between the beams, so part of the beam ends up being encapsulated by that joint. Uh, we end up with about a 16 inch total width of the joint some additional space uh, in the deck, again, to create the splice for our negative moment reinforcement. For that positive moment connection at the bottom, uh, we embedded number three rebar shear studs into the bottom flange of the beam. Uh, with a standard hook, there were two on each side uh, of each bottom flange uh, to be able to transfer those straight bars um, tension force into the girder at the bottom of the beam. The negative moment reinforcement was the same as what was designed for the new construction, uh, but again with a straight splice bar uh, and a splice that was based on UHPC recommendations from FHWA. Uh, so these are a couple of pictures of the new construction detail. So showing those strands extended into the joint, showing the overlap of the reinforcement from each side of the deck uh, and strain gauges placed on the reinforcement to measure strains uh, during our load test. Uh, the same thing for the retrofit construction specimen. You can see the, the rebar studs here at the bottom, the straight bars extending across between the two flanges, uh, and then the rebar lap splice uh, at the top in the negative moment region. For the UHPC, uh, we used a commercially available UHPC product, um, so a proprietary UHPC mix that was mixed in our lab using this high shear horizontal axis mixer. Uh, had a compressive strength of about 24.5 KSI uh, for each set of joints. Uh, and these are some pictures of the completed joints. Uh, you can see a little bit of desiccation on the surface uh, because of the formwork that we were using, but it didn't extend uh, into the, the connection at all. Uh, it was just a surface consideration uh, for this uh, research. Um, 
this is the retrofit connection. You can see it's a little bit wider. Again, encapsulates some of the beam ends, so it looks more like a block uh, than the other one did. And then for testing these specimens, we looked at two different tests uh, for each girder specimen. Uh, it was a two girder, a single joint specimen, uh, so a two span system. Uh, we would do one test for negative moment where we had supports uh, at each ends of the girders with the joint in between. We'd have a single point load at mid span of each girder. We would measure deflection underneath the point load, measure deformation uh, of our bearing pads uh, with LVDTs at each point, and then measure any opening of the joint at the interface between the beam and the UHPC connection. Uh, we would also do a positive moment test where we would remove this center support uh, and test um, with those same point loads to see what would happen um, in terms of positive moment resistance at the joint. This is a picture of that two-span beam system being tested for negative moment. So it's supported here at the center, single point load at mid-span of each girder uh, to apply a negative moment across that joint. And again, this specimen was designed to develop the full strengths of the beams. So we were looking for failure in the beam, not at the joint necessarily. Uh, and so we had typical cracking in the beams that would include uh, flexural cracks underneath the joint and then as or underneath the load. And as we move to the connection, uh, we would see flexural cracking starting at the top uh, and then flexure shear cracking um, coming out away from the, the joint and moving back toward the joint. Uh, if we look at in between the, the joint and the load point, uh, we would see, again, flexural cracks as we start to move away from the joint that turn into shear cracks and then some web shear cracks in between uh, due to the joint attracting more shear than we anticipated. Uh, within the continuity joint itself, uh, we would see very fine cracks uh, that for the new construction joint formed at higher loads. Uh, we would mark those uh, with a permanent marker, which makes them look larger than they really were. Uh, but for the new construction, we saw several cracks uh, that were spread out uh, reasonably well. Uh, for the retrofit connection, we saw a few cracks, uh, not as many, uh, but they occurred at lower loads than what we saw for new construction. Uh, when we took out that middle support and tested for positive moment um, for the new construction, the types of damage that we saw were cracks at the joint interface uh, on either time, uh, and then also saw flexural cracks out away from that interface uh, in the section where we didn't have the full pre-stress. For the retrofit construction, we only saw that damage at the interface. We didn't see it out into the beam. In terms of behavior of these specimens, uh, if we look at load deflection for the girders, uh, this is typical for the new construction where we would see uh, an initial linear portion cracking leading to nonlinear behavior uh, and then yielding uh, type behavior of our beams. So basically we saw a good flexural failure uh, in our beam specimens for the new construction specimens. Uh, we saw the same thing for the retrofit construction specimens. If we compare these two, uh, joint details, we can look at uh, their cracking performance and their ultimate load performance. For cracking uh, of our new construction joint, we saw our first flexural crack somewhere in the 40 to 45 kip load range. Uh, we saw flexural cracks near the joint interface, um, somewhere in that same range, uh, and then flexural shear cracks at the joint interface uh, at about that 40 to 45 kip range as well. Uh, we first started seeing flexural cracks in the joint at about 45 kips uh, for specimens one and two, uh, which were not tested in positive moment first. And we saw that crack happen earlier in that third specimen that was tested for positive moment first. For the retrofit construction specimens, uh, we saw the first crack under the point load at a little bit higher load, so a little stiffer specimen. Uh, we saw the first cracks near the joints, however, at lower loads than what we saw for the new construction. In terms of maximum values for the new construction type joint, our ultimate loads were about 71 kips on average, uh, about two inches of deflection, about 0.09 inches uh, of joint opening, so over here on the right, uh, and we didn't see strains high enough in our negative moment steel to represent yielding of the steel. Uh, for the retrofit construction specimen, however, uh, we did see a slightly higher load, slightly lower deflection, slightly lower joint opening, uh, and strains that indicated yielding of our negative moment steel, so we had a slightly stiffer connection. Uh, and then for both sets of specimens, both new construction and retrofit construction, uh, if you look at this bottom row, uh, we saw about a 30% uh, increase in moment carrying capacity 
uh, when we added that continuity connection relative to the simply supported beams. So from our laboratory investigation, uh, we saw that at least for ultimate load capacity and developing continuity between our beams, uh, the UHPC connection performed very well. Uh, and we happened to get the opportunity from ODOT uh, to do this as a replacement uh, on a bridge that was in service. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Trevor uh, to talk about that. Thank you, Royce. Um, so uh, to circle back to the Wolf Creek Bridge, uh, that was in Fort Supply, Oklahoma, it's in Northwest Oklahoma. It's a five span bridge with the three interior spans being continuous uh, for live load. And just for uh, future reference with the for the numbering scheme that we used in this test uh, to match the drawings, the, the first span on the on the right or the east side is span one, uh, and then they were numerically increased all the way to span five. So the, the continuous spans were span two, three, and four. Uh, there's a, the panoramic again, and then a picture of the linkage block uh, continuity joint that was used on that bridge. And then this is the picture of the damage that was caused in that uh, continuity joint. This is the exterior joint. As you can see, it's got pretty extensive, large cracking um, that occurred and it extends all the way to the bottom, which which indicates uh, the positive moment issue uh, caused by the, the creep and shrimp it, shrinkage issues. So since it, it had this damage uh, and as a, to uh, proceed the testing that we did in the lab, ODOT had tasked to repair this the continuity joints of this bridge with ultra high performance concrete uh, to help improve the continuity and it provided us a unique opportunity to test this bridge in situ and see if we can monitor how much continuity or continuity is actually uh, uh, continued after we repair it so the uh, the testing involved post or pre repair and post repair testing so before construction started, we, we went out to the Wolf Creek Bridge and we instrumented it under span four. Uh, it was the easiest span that we could get to. The, unfortunately, water was over under span three and then the joints between span two and three were also over water, so we couldn't instrument those for the later testing. So we just stuck with, with span four and we instrumented each of the girders uh, to monitor deflections for the pre-repair test since we had no access to the inside of the joint. Um, and we used two methods to try to monitor deflection. Uh, the first method was using a, a laser distance measure that we attached to a, a steel pole that was um, stabilized with a sandbag and pointed directly to the bottom of each of the five girders uh, across the, the, the width of the bridge. And uh, during each load step, which I'll describe in a second, uh, we took measurements of deflection and compared them to the uh, non-loaded structure to see if we could monitor deflection. The second method that we used for monitoring deflection was a manual method where we, we had a, a wood clamp attached to the bottom bell of the girder and we hung a plung bob from it and, and a, uh, embedded a, a two by four into the ground that had a, uh, a tape measure attached to it. We used a T-square to uh, uh, transfer the movement of that plumb bob to the ruler and uh, measured the deflection in millimeters. As I mentioned, we did multiple load stages uh, to monitor this, and to do this testing, uh, we had to close the bridge down uh, to one lane for most of it, and then for one of the load stages, we, we closed it entirely. Uh, but the load stages consisted of marching the one of the trucks across uh, and then having another truck follow it. So load stage one was a single truck. Load stage two was uh, two trucks in different spans and then marching them across for three, and then to the point where four, whereas a single truck on the far span and then we backed truck two up for span three for low stage five. And then uh, to try to elicit a large response, we put we closed the entire bridge down for final uh, the final load stage and put both trucks on span four directly over where we're measuring. And during each load stage, the trucks were parked in place uh, where approximately the center of mass was at the, the centroid of the girder. Uh, and they, they were kept there until uh, measurements could be taken uh, and you'll see this in the data unfortunately we had to keep one of the lanes open for all of the load six load stage six uh, so there was a little bit of background noise from continued traffic uh, and as Walt mentioned this tra this bridge gets a lot of agricultural and oil field traffic so there's a lot of heavy trucks going over it uh, but we were we were able to get some some good data later uh, uh, after the pre uh, the pre repair test, the construction crew came in and they started their repair process. And uh, the first first that they did was demolished all of uh, the material out of all of the joints, 
and it gave us an opportunity to throw some instrumentation in the joint so we can try to monitor strains during the next load test to see if we can uh, find continuity. So we embedded uh, two different types of strain gauges in two of the joints. Uh, the first strain gauge, the bottom one, is uh, it's a foil strain gauge, a six millimeter uh, gauge length strain gauge, typical of steel, and it's attached to a uh, number three piece of rebar, and it was directly tied to the pre-stressing strands that are sticking out of the, the ends of the girders. And then the other strain gauge is a vibrating wire strain gauge. Uh, it's also tied to a number three. And because uh, vibrating wire strain, strain gauges have to have material wrapped around the entire uh, perimeter, they're offset from the piece of bar with some foam blocks. Uh, and that way, whenever the, the UHPC is poured, it'll completely envelop the, uh, the vibrating wire strain gauge. And we had these gauges placed on the exterior girder on the south side of the bridge and on the very center of the girder, or the very center uh, girder uh, at the center of the bridge, so we can see if there's any difference in load transfer across the width as well as, uh, as the, the trucks were marched across the bridge. Uh, the, fortunately, um, the UHBC material that was placed uh, actually met the strengths that we were able to get in the, uh, in the lab, so we had direct comparisons. There was no special curing on these. Um, they were just cast in the field and then taken to either the ODOT lab or the OU lab for compression testing. Um, and our, our results more or less lined up. Uh, we had uh, three main pours for the construction. The first pour, which I'll talk about a little bit later, was uh, ha had a, had some issues, so they couldn't continue. But the, the second and third pours were fine, so we took specimens back to the lab. And as you can see, within three days, we were uh, at or above uh, 10 KSI concrete, which is uh, far and above what you need to open a bridge and well, uh, very high uh, relative to the concrete that was in place. And I should mention that this was the first time that the contractor actually worked with UHPC. So there was there were some lessons learned and uh, there was a learning curve and there was a lot of communication between us and the contractor to, to help smooth the process because it is such a different material. Uh, and during the entire placement, we had a representative on site from the, the manufacturer of the UHPC uh, that, that helped guide some of the, the construction practices. The uh, UHPC manufacturer actually provided mixers the, uh, because UHPC is unique in the sense that it needs high shear mixing to actually break it apart and form the actual flowable material. So it provided a uh, horizontal, uh, vertical shaft, uh, high shear mixers, very similar to what you would mix a mortar in. Um, and then they were uh, dry uh, bags were busted into the top of the mixer. And after the, after the dry material was added, the liquid material was added slowly as the mixer was run. And then it was allowed to mix until probably it was about 15 minutes, maybe, until it uh, it reached a point we call breakover, where it goes from a powder to a liquid. And once that point hits, the steel fibers shown here that were added, and these are uh, 0.2 millimeter, half inch long um, steel wire, which uh, we, we like to call little hypodermic needles. Inside of the UHPC, they they, they tend to present some hazards whenever you're playing with it. Uh, after the fibers were added, they were allowed to mix for a few minutes, and then the, the QC test will run. The flowability test is uh, it's a similar to a mortar flow test, except instead of they use the same drop table setup and the same cone. The difference is, is once the cone's lifted, it's only allowed uh, to flow out over a certain amount of time instead of dropping the table since it's such a fluid material. And the, the representative from the company uh, monitored every single batch that was made because multiple batches were made for each for each set of pours and, and made sure that the flowability was in uh, what they recommended so it could flow. And then uh, if you click next slide again, you'll, here's a video of the mixer running with the material in it. And as you can see, it's, it's a very fluid and it's a very thick mixture. It's a highly viscous, very flowable material that it moves very slowly, but it, it'll get to where it's going. Um, it just takes some time. Uh, but because of that fluidity, we were allowed to use a unique placement method. Um, this material was placed through two and a half inch diameter holes poked through the top of the, uh, the bridge deck that was centered over each of the continuity joints. And this particular material was required to pour above the top of the finish, uh, the finished road. So the, uh, the two by fours were placed so we could increase the, the height. Uh, and then the video on the right shows that the, U the UHPC was poured out of a bucket into a funnel and a contractor, you just used a piece of rebar to help push the, the material down uh, in through the funnel. But as you can see, it really had no problems flowing through that small hole uh, and filling up the entire joint. 
but unfortunately we did have some issues as i mentioned the the first attempt at the concrete pour uh went smoothly for a little bit they managed to, to fill up an entire form and then uh we had a form blowout uh, that bottom piece of board that you see on the right uh popped out because it was attached with tapcon screws and uh, the tapcon screws failed and blew the form out and uh they lost all the material out of that joint um so they had to redo it and uh, we had told the contractors that this material does um, maintain fluidity for a very long time. It, it tends to have an initial set time around seven to nine hours, depending on the material. And, and so it, it maintains this fluidity and this head pressure in the forms for a long time. Uh, so for future pours, the, the contractor didn't want that to happen again. So they braced the interior form work uh, against opposing joints and added extra tap cons uh, where needed. And for the exterior joint, they braced it against the bridge deck and the bent uh, so they wouldn't have any fo uh, form failures after that. And fortunately, there was one minor incident when they started pouring uh, one of the last joints, but uh, they were able to correct it uh, while placing other joints. So there was no major issue after this first form blowout and everything went smooth. So after the joints were completed, this is what they look like uh, after the form work was removed. And one of the great things about UHPC and the fluidity uh, that, it, that it has, it allows it to fill up a lot of small insignificant gaps that conventional concrete may not. Uh, so if you look at the left picture, you'll notice that some of the damage that was caused to the girder during uh, the demolition, which is, is just part of demolition, um, was actually filled in by the UHPC because it was so fluid. It was a very small section, uh, but it was able to cover up that portion of the concrete to add extra protection. And then I'll talk more about this in the lesson learned, but the picture on the right, the uh, the joint looks kind of scarred. Uh, the surface of it, 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 it tend to attach to the formwork. And as the formwork was pulled off, it, it took this surface layer off. Um, we investigated it and it was really just superficial damage uh, on the surface. But uh, the uh, because UHPC is a very low water cementitious material ratio uh, material that, it, it tends to leach moisture pretty fast, and if it loses moisture, it, it doesn't cure as well. Um, so this this tended to happen when the former wasn't prepared properly. And so the now the test results uh, after after the repairs were done, we did the post repair test, same exact way that we did the pre repair, except that we were able to collect uh, strain data from the exterior from an exterior and uh, the center joint, uh, and compare that to the the deflection data that we we were able to collect. The, the table in the lower right hand corner is all of our deflection data. Now, as Walt mentioned, this is a 385 foot spans of a type four girder that is heavily pre-stressed. So it's a very, very, very stiff structure uh, with a very short span. And because of the short span, we were limited in truck size to make sure that we didn't shed too much to the supports uh, through shear. So we were trying to induce flexure. So we ended up with some very small deflections. Um, I think we did the, the best we could. We got the biggest truck. They were the first test. They were about 50,000 pounds each and the second they were about 55,000 pounds. Um, and then uh, but because they were so small and we in the pre repair test, we didn't have any other method for uh, monitoring the, the behavior. We just did some simple calculations to the compare compare them to a simple span deflection. And um, they came out pretty close uh, despite the fact that they were small. Uh, but with the post repair test, we had the additional data from the strain gauges, so we were able to see uh, more of the behavior. And if you look in the plot on the left, that is the foil strain gauge, which can monitor it maintains uh, strain data collection continuously. That's why you see a lot of those jumps. As I mentioned, we had to keep one lane open during most of the uh, testing and the, uh, the traffic that was going by, especially some of the bigger trucks, tend to cause the strain to, uh, to jump during testing. But one thing I wanted to point out that really showed uh, what we believe to be success and restored continuity is at load stage four, where a single truck is in span two, which is on the far uh, adjacent span, that that condition should cause a positive moment in the continuity joints that we added the instrumentation. And as you can see, the, the negative strains um, indicate negative uh, moment or compression. And then the positive strains indicate tension on. So we had positive strains at load stage four, which would show that we were able to maintain, uh, restore continuity uh, after using the UHPC joint. And then the upper right hand plot is a comparison of the average of the foil gauge readings and then the, the incremental readings that we took with the uh, vibrating wire strain gauges. And while the values were slightly different, the uh, 
the same behavior was observed with the, with the vibrating wire strain gauges. And at low stage four, we were able to have positive strains indicating tension in the bottom, uh, which indicates a positive moment, which uh, shows that the, uh, the UHPC joint was able to restore continuity um, once it was in place. So this was done uh, uh, in 2019. So we've been able to monitor it throughout time. Uh, these were the joints uh, about a year after. Uh, and this, this center joint is the joint that had the issue with the formwork, uh, pulling water from the UHPC and, and, and taking some of the material with it. And as you can see, it more or less looks the same. Uh, it, it was in fact just superficial damage on the surface. Uh, there wasn't any indication that that damage extended any farther. And then the other two joints appeared to be uh, performing just fine. There's no apparent damage. And the, in the left picture, you see where some of the UHPC reached into the damage caused by the demolition. And it was it's still maintained there. Even in a thin section, it was not pulled off. Um, next slide. And these are these those very same joints after three years. We just recently took pictures. Uh, and they look more or less the same, with slight lighting differences. Um, no additional damage appears to be caused by uh, uh, environmental um, conditions. And UHPC, because of its uh, very, very low permeability, it tends to resist a lot of the traditional attacks um, that most concretes are susceptible to. So it seems to be performing really well after three years. Uh, and we, were, we were able to maintain cont restore continuity with the new UHPC joint. So lessons learned from this construction. As I mentioned, this was the first time the contractor had ever used UHPC, and it is a very different material. Um, so we did have a few lessons learned. Uh, the first main one was the formwork pressure. Because the very, very uh, long initial set time and the, and the fact that it maintains slow ability so long, you have to be very careful about the way you design the formwork because it, it won't harden up as fast as conventional concrete. So you have to maintain, you have to have some stronger formwork. And we more or less described it as maintaining water tightness for a long period of time. Uh, while the, the, str the stresses will be higher, you want to make sure that if water can get through it, UHPC will find a way to get through. Um, so the uh, the issue with the uh, formwork pressure is something that the contractor needs to consider. Uh, the next is about the the small placement hole. While it was great and very a lot less invasive than a typical repair, um, one of the issues that we found was that we would top off a joint, and then we would walk away and go move on to the next joint. And when we go back and look at it again, we'd see that the material settled. Now, because it is such a viscous material, it tends to trap air bubbles, but those air bubbles will eventually work their way up to the top. Uh, so when you initially top the material off, it's still got entrapped air that's going to work its way out. Uh, so that's something to, to consider is uh, you may have to top it off uh, incrementally as you continue your pour until all of the air is uh, removed. And I think part of this might have just been because it was such a small hole. Um, another way that you might be able to fix this is provide a... Uh, uh, some sort of weep hole somewhere else to allow air to come out um, that might help fill in uh, remove the air a little bit more efficiently so you won't have to come back and top off the material and the uh, as we mentioned the, the flowability is something that it's it's very nice for placement but it can cause problems later on with your with your uh, your formwork and the fact that it will continue to move when you think it's uh, when you think you're finished and then lastly with the the issue with the material to pull off of the formwork um, that that tends to happen it, especially whenever you use something like plywood that will leach moisture out of the material. So the best way to do that, to mitigate this, is to either coat it with a polyurethane or just pre-treat it with water, just so that way uh, it, it won't suck the moisture out of the, the UHPC that's placed against it. And one way, one thing that you can, uh, you can do to kill two birds with one stone is to conduct, your, conduct your own water tightness test. So just fill the entire joint up with water and see if water leaks out. Uh, and if it doesn't, just let it sit there for a bit and let the UHPC and the concrete um, to suck up some of the water and then pump all of that out. And you can place the UHPC knowing that's a watertight joint. And then you have uh, water ingress in your formwork, um, also in your con in the, the repairing concrete. Uh, so that way you're less likely to have the issues uh, of UHPC uh, sticking to the formwork. And, and so how is this uh, accelerated bridge construction? Well. This was a, a very fast project. Uh, this was the first time that Oklahoma has done this type of repair, uh, replacing those continuity joints and doing it with, the, with this kind of material really extends the bridge life because it is a very durable material. And so we, we were able to extend the service life without having to replace the bridge um, with, with, with a pretty quick repair. And it was a very fast repair process. We, uh, we only had to drill 
a two and a half inch hole in the top surface. So there wasn't a whole lot of demo demolition to do or uh, any sort of post repair work after uh, after joint placement, just because it was it was uh, less invasive of a typical repair. And then the uh, the instrumentation aspect of this particular project slowed the contractor down a little bit, so they had to wait for us uh, academics to get on the bridge and, and apply our gauges. Um, so we we tried to be as uh, we tried to be as less invasive as possible, but uh, unfortunately, we just interrupted. But even with that, it averaged about a five-day process per joint, and so you really limited the amount of time that we had to close the bridge down. Uh, and and because the the contractor did one side of the bridge at a time, uh, it was able to maintain one lane open at all times, so it was never completely closed down. Uh, and I'll after that, I'll, I'll hand it off to uh, Royce uh, to follow on with some con conclusions. All right, and so to just kind of finish up, uh, we've talked about research done in the lab, we've talked about field implementation and kind of the ongoing work that's sponsored by ABC UTC is trying to bring that together uh, along with the UHPC literature and that on this type of continuity connection to develop some design guidance for UHPC continuity conjoints uh, that includes looking at um, details that are used throughout the country, some of the work that's been done by ODOT uh, and in the literature uh, to be able to um, develop some connection details that were then tested in the lab and hopefully uh, be able to provide some guidance based on ASHTO LRFD provisions that will be ready uh, through a final report and an ABC UTC guide early next year. Um, so to just give you a little bit uh, of context of what we're doing there, uh, again we've designed um, some connection details using the properties of UHPC uh, for that connection uh, constructed some of those specimens using both a proprietary and a non-proprietary UHPC uh, and are currently testing those in the lab. Uh, and in this case, we're using two half-length beams with a connection in the middle uh, and loading them right side up uh, to create positive moment at the bottom of the joint and upside down to create negative moment at the top of the joint uh, to examine the capacity of those connections. So in conclusion, um, the UHPC connection exhibited excellent ultimate load performance in the lab. Uh, it allows for a smaller connection with less congested reinforcement due to the shortened required splice lengths, which is one thing we're testing right now. Uh, the retrofit connection that we examined increased the stiffness of the joint, uh, potentially allowed uh, for a higher capacity, so strengthening existing bridges could be a possibility. Uh, and then in both cases, the failure of the system was outside of the joint and in the girder uh, for both new construction and retrofit connections, which would need to be taken into account uh, in design. Um, time dependent effects could still cause cracking at the joint interface or in the girder. Uh, so that uh, again needs to be considered when designing these types of connections. Uh, but we were successfully able to replace one of these uh, continuity connection linkage blocks uh, in the field using UHPC. Uh, the field testing indicated it, live load continuity was restored for this bridge, uh, and those joints appear to be in good condition after nearly three years in service. Uh, so that concludes our presentation. Uh, we appreciate your uh, time and attendance. We appreciate the sponsors of this research and those that donated materials, uh, and we'll be happy to answer questions with the time that we have remaining. All right, thank you, Royce, for a great presentation. At this point, we're going to turn it to Paul Lives, who is going to be uh, moderating the question and answer with, together with uh, Jugesh Kapoor. Uh, Paul, it's all yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Atari. And uh, real good, <clears throat> Walt, um, Royce, and Trevor. We do have a few questions that came in during the presentation, and we also had some questions that came in. Uh, beforehand and we've kind of broke them down and maybe to design construction and cost questions and with that we'll uh, go ahead and get underway um, the first one is uh, <clears throat> was how often does the Oklahoma DOT see loss of live load continuity with precast pre-stress girders particularly those early ones well I would say that we probably need to do a little survey. Um, I just don't think we have enough information at this time to correctly answer that. Okay, uh, that's that's fine, Walt. But then there was another question, and this came in during the presentation. It said, um, 
you said that from 73 to 85, uh, y'all did continuity for live loads. The question was, uh, why did maybe you stop? Why, why did the design people stop doing it? And if, if they did stop, uh, have they started doing it again? Okay. Um, in 85, there was, um, looking in the maintenance folder, a pretty good survey done on that Calvin Bridge, which was our first one, which uh, showed a lot of cracking, which I think at the time was a surprise. And uh, so we, um, we stopped doing it and we went to a detail where we made our deck continuous um, for like three or four spans, uh, but we got away from the linkage blocks. We've used it like when we widened a bridge that had linkage blocks, we did it again, but there's been very few instances where, where we've used live load con continuity uh, since, since this, um, we, we discovered the cracking issue. Okay. And uh, there was another question that came in uh, about, uh, this is during your presentation, it said, please describe the linkage blocks, the ones that uh, uh, you had. And you had two sheets, maybe five or prob probably 10 was the better one that showed it. You Could you just describe it a little bit? You showed a picture of it. Okay. Well, a uh, type four beam is 26 inches wide. Uh, so there's about a foot opening between the two girders and basically you make a chunk of concrete going from the bottom of the bottom flange up to the deck and um, generally a lot of them the only reinforcement was the strands uh, in a few of them we put a few stirrup bars and uh, like Wolf Creek had a lot of uh, pre-stressing strands that um, extended um, out of the beam besides the ones that were about three feet long or two and a half. Um, so that's the best I can describe it. No, that's good. And the concrete was just regular uh, superstructure concrete, the deck concrete? Right, it's a double A concrete. That'd be 4,000 PSI, but back then it was probably 3,500. Okay, that's good. Um, then, um, there's a question that came in uh, beforehand about uh, uh, where can we find the recommended design guidelines for the concepts presented during the webinar? So we're, we're still working on getting that finalized and hopefully again, we'll have those reports and uh, guide early next year uh, and they will be posted on the ABC UTC website under the research section as products of this project. Uh, and then we'll also be linked to the archive of this webinar once they're in place. Okay. Um, we can move over to some uh, construction questions. Um, and the first one was, is the Oklahoma DOT developing this to a point where it becomes a standard with specifications for the materials? Not at this time. I mean, as we learn more from, more from Dr. Floyd's research, uh, we, we may want to give that some consideration, but that's more up to my boss. Okay. Um, then uh, there was a question that came in, the UHP, uh, UHPC material used in the project, was it proprietary or non-proprietary? Uh, so the, the product used in the field was a proprietary material. Okay. Uh, another question that came in beforehand was, uh, is the UHP UHPC material used in this project? Excuse me. Um, it, no, another question. It seems that this type of connection would produce more deck cracks at the supports. Uh, how do you limit those cracks and any moisture intrusion associated with the cracks? Well, the moisture intrusion, we saw very little of that at any of the linkage blocks I surveyed, except for the one way out in the panhandle, which I think was a concrete issue. There, in the top of the deck, there are negative moment cracks. Um, it's um, I just they aren't bad enough that we get moisture penetration, and I hope that answers your question. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, 
final uh, question on the construction section that I have is, uh, this came in beforehand. It says, what were the lessons learned from the project? You covered that on sheet 75. And uh, you can throw that sheet up real quick. I just wanted to ask if there was anything more you wanted to add to what you covered. No, I think we uh, I think we covered most of the lessons learned. Uh, I think the biggest the biggest thing coming out of the construction is just uh, coordination with the contractor, especially if they've never used it, um, because it is a very unique, different material than conventional concrete, even though it's called concrete. Uh, so they, the, they tend to widen their eyes when you start to tell them some of these things. But uh, just co early coordination will help mitigate a lot of these. OK, yeah, I've got yeah, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to just to add to what Trevor said, you know, it's on that slide, but you know, the, the depth of these continuity connections is quite a bit more than what you usually get for UHPC, you know, if you're doing deck panels or something. Uh, and so that kind of compounds the, the formwork pressure issue. Okay. Uh, I got a couple of question, questions involving cost, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jugash. The first one was, uh, what is the unit cost of the UHPC? This came in beforehand. So, you know, that, that depends a lot on what product that you're using and what services that you're getting with the unit cost. Um, and so it can be, you know, bid different ways. Um, and for the material that was used on this project, it was about $3,000 to $3,500 a cubic yard. Um, other proprietary materials are kind of in that same range. Uh, if you start including you know, the services of the supplier, et cetera, can be up to $10,000 a cubic yard. Uh, and then if you look at non-proprietary mixes, you know, it may be down to $800 a cubic yard um, just for the material. Um, and then, you know, you're providing some of those other items. Okay. And there was a question about that on the, the number for the $800 a yard. That's just the material cost. That's not going to be an installed cost. Correct, just the material cost, and most of that cost is in the form of the steel fibers. Okay, uh, I do have one more question here I want to pick up, and then I'll get it to you, Gash. Uh, was traffic maintained across the bridge while repairs were being passed? Yeah, they, they consistently had one lane open. Uh, they would close one half of the bridge to do some of the joints, and then once those were done, they flipped. Okay. Uh, it's uh, about seven after, and we've got a bunch more questions that have come in. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jugash, and he's going to pick up now. Jugash? Okay, thank you, Paul. You've uh, picked up quite a few of the questions, Paul, that came in during the webinar. So I'm just going to jump over to the remaining ones. First one is Trevor mentioned the contractor did the bridge a half at a time. Since bridges are designed to distribute the load, it would seem that the last joint repaired would take distribution loads while curing. Did they notice any cracking or, or ill effects from this? That's a good point. We didn't we didn't see any uh, we'll say any additional cracking or damage just from uh, the construction procedures. Uh, but just of note was that because of the damage on the joint, it was more or less just assumed that it was behaving simply supported. Uh, and UHPC, the, the beauty of this material itself is it gains strength pretty fast. So it was probably at 4,000 PSI in about a day. Uh, once it finally hit final set, um, it gets to the, the strength of the joints uh, pretty quick. Okay, thank you. Next question, did you ever see this being used to reduce the 90 day wait time for beams used in simple made continuous bridges? Uh, so in terms of having seen it done so far, we have not seen that because we haven't seen anybody, to my knowledge, use UHPC in this application uh, beyond what we've been working on. Uh, but we do think there is potential for that to be a possibility with this material having such a high tension res resistance uh, that it can withstand uh, more of that demand uh, than what a conventional concrete joint could do. Okay, thank you. Next question, what was determined to be the reason for pier diaphragm cracking? Shrinkage and creep issue, the uh, positive moment, um, time dependent, uh, plus I think some of the thermal loads such as a temperature gradient can be a contributing factor. Um, 
that, that's all I can think of. Yeah, so basically, you know, getting additional compression strain in the bottom of the beam, uh, making it want to bend upward, but the joint restraining it uh, tends to create tension at the bottom of that joint. Okay, thank you. Next question, in terms of the rigidity and due to the high compressive strength of UHPC, in comparison with the conventional concrete used for the girders, did you check the interface between the continuity joint and the girders? Do you continue to monitor the continuity joint? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but the um, we did consider the interface between the, the beam and the UHPC, um, with UHPC having a very high bond strength. Um, it's typically going to be as much as the conventional concrete strength, that interface. Uh, and we did monitor the joints in the field over time. Uh, we've, you know, observed them for three years about at this point and haven't seen any additional cracks develop um, in those regions. Okay, thank you. And last question, did you use hydro demolition to remove existing concrete from rebar? Uh, no, they, they used traditional uh, methods of just jackhammers and chipping hammers to remove the concrete. Okay. I think that was the last question that came in while, the, while Paul was asking the questions. So I've gone through my list. I'll turn it back to Adarod. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. If I can uh, have you with us, Royce and Trevor, for, for a minute. So this concludes our webinar. Uh, Royce, uh, uh, since we have uh, just a couple of minutes, maybe one question. Did you all also prepare the end of the pre-stress girder to make sure that there is a perfect bond between the UHPC and the normal strength concrete by any chance? Uh, so that's a good question. And to, to say that we prepared it to get perfect bond uh, is not a good way to describe it. Uh, it was mostly uh, preparation based on the demolition uh, and the chipping that they were doing. So it was kind of a semi-chipped surface. Uh, I don't believe, and Trevor can correct me if I'm wrong here, I don't believe they sandblasted those ends. Um, no. We've found uh, from our testing that if you're looking to bond to existing concrete, sandblasting it creates an excellent surface uh, for bonding. Uh, and so that is a recommendation that we would make uh, if you're doing something like this. Uh, for the specimens that we've tested in the lab, uh, we've looked at them in a similar condition to what was done in the field. Um, and uh, it kind of creates a worst case scenario. So the, the results that we presented for the lab testing were a similar surface preparation to what was done in the field. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks Royce. It was an excellent presentation. So that concludes our uh, December 2022 webinar, and this was our last webinar of the 2022. Our next webinar is going to be in January of the 2023, and uh, we hope to see many of you at the TRB. And on behalf of the, all the partner universities, faculties, and the staff, and the graduate students at ABCUTC, we would like to wish you a very Merry Christmas and very happy holidays. We hope you enjoy the holidays and uh, see you back with us again in January of the 2023. So on that note, we will conclude the webinar. Thank you.